Okay, so I wanted to talk about this article from a few months ago. It's by Matthew Iglesias, I think is how you say his name, uh, co-founder of Vox. And it's exactly what the title says. You know, he argues that the best thing that you can do to fight climate change is to vote Democrat. Um, more importantly, he argues that ethical consumption, so like giving up meat, is not only not helpful, but actually harmful. So yes, absolutely, voting is important, particularly if you live somewhere where voting has a huge impact, right? So like in a swing state. Um, it's hard to argue that your one vote makes that much of a difference if you live somewhere super blue, for instance, like Portland, Oregon. Also, while voting is, I think, pretty easy for a lot of us, um, it can be really hard, if not impossible, for others. So we all know about certain areas with corrupt politicians who are closing polling stations and making it as hard as possible for people who they know are not going to vote for them um, to be able to vote in the first place. So if voting is convenient for you and you live in one of these places where voting really counts, then Obviously, the cost-benefit analysis is pretty hard to beat. Matt doesn't get into any of this in the article, you know, the complexity of voting and impact versus actual effort, which is unfortunate. Um, he basically just focuses on how bad Republicans are for the environment, which, yeah, sure, on average, yes, absolutely. The only thing that they have going for them is being pro-nuclear. But even more unfortunately is the other point that Matt makes, which I said earlier, that vegetarianism is not only ineffective in the fight against climate change, but it's actually counterproductive. Consider meat. Environmentalists have emphasized for years that meat production is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. And if we all went vegan, we would enjoy lifestyles that are not only healthier, albeit considerably less delicious, in most cases, but vastly more sustainable from an ecological point of view. That is a ridiculous sentence. <laughs> that is way too long. But suppose you personally decide to cut back on your meat consumption. As demand for meat falls, the price of meat will fall. As we've seen in the past, Americans on the whole eat less meat when it's expensive and more when it's cheap. Gasoline is similar. My wife and I both walk to work and do the vast majority of our errands on foot in our walkable neighborhood. On the rare occasions that we do drive, we drive a Prius. And the aggregate impact of our much lower than average gasoline consumption is to provide a teeny tiny subsidy via cheaper gasoline to people who do drive gas guzzlers on a daily basis. You as an individual opting out of that overconsumption fails to address the problem because it pushes the price down, leaving the externality unpriced and continuing the trend of global overconsumption. So according to Matt, if you buy less of something, the price will go down, which then causes other people to buy even more, causing more consumption. Like how you can't lower the price of housing by building more houses, because if you build it, they will come, and that will make houses more expensive because people are buying more houses? So obviously that's really dumb, and what's worse is that Matt obviously knows that it's really dumb. He is very pro Yimby. He is constantly advocating for building more houses to deal with the housing crisis in places like Portland and Seattle and San Francisco. So, you know, I guess his ignorance of economics is only limited to dunking on vegetarians. Cool. The basic law of economics is supply and demand, taking one as a given and unchanging supply, so that would be Matt's assumption about meat, or an unchanging demand, so my stupid housing analogy misses the entire point. There are very few resources that have a truly fixed supply or demand like that. Even land isn't fixed if demand is high enough. Just look at Hong Kong. Meat isn't falling from the sky in some fixed proportion with no input from human beings. Meat is produced by animals who are bred by humans and fed by humans, all at expense for resources and labor. When the price of meat falls, farms take a hit and their already slim margins suffer. They're not going to keep making more meat at a lower price because vegetarians didn't buy it. Instead, investment into new animal farms wanes, slowing increase in production, and some farmers are even more motivated to get out of the business. Supply of meat is actually remarkably flexible versus something like avocados that are going to yield whatever was planted, depending on the weather, and they have to be sold shortly thereafter. Meat is much different. When the market is really bad, farmers will actually hold on to their animals longer because obviously live animals don't spoil like carcasses or fruit do. When price drops, supply drops shortly thereafter. The only given is what's already on store shelves. What makes Matt's claim so 
ridiculous, so stupid. I'm sorry, I'm actually a big fan of Matt. I like a lot of what he says. I'm very pro Yimby as well, so I do follow him on Twitter. I like a lot of his tweets, <laughs> but it's so stupid. And what makes it even stupider <laughs> is that the reality is that the price drops that we've seen, the price reductions in meat that we've seen in recent history are obviously due to increased demand. It's due to factory farms pumping out more meat and distribution networks taking advantage of economies of scale while rent on store shelves is falling per item due to higher turnover. When I buy, say, a veggie burger from a store that has been sitting on the shelf for a week, I pay for that. That's why a meat burger that has been on the shelf for like a few hours is cheaper. It's because of high demand, not in spite of it. It has paid less rent. It's not that soybeans are more expensive than meat. Quite the opposite. Meat is absolutely more resource intensive to make. Tofu and mock meats should absolutely be cheaper than meat based on the resources needed to make them. The only reason they aren't is because not enough people buy them, which would streamline the process from farm to consumer. A good example, a very recent example, is a Chinese import of chicken feet from the US. Obviously, chicken feet here has no value. That consumption and willing to pay a premium for what were once considered undesirable cuts has subsidized the Western market. But again, this is all about increased demand and increased consumption. Matt is slightly less wrong when it comes to gasoline, but he's, he's still wrong. Supply isn't fixed there either. Ever heard of deep sea drilling? tar sands, as demand grows and price with it, companies find more oil resources to exploit at that price point, thus filling the demand and stabilizing the price. When demand drops and price with it, it becomes less worth it to exploit these resources. And supply falls until the price stabilizes. So yes, it is still worth it, absolutely, to use less gas. Buying less of a commodity with a flexible supply doesn't decrease the price and ensure that other people will buy more of it. And it definitely doesn't mean they'll buy so much more that it actually nullifies your abstention or more ridiculously makes matters worse. By being vegetarian, you absolutely help the environment and giving up other animal products like eggs and dairy helps even more. Matt isn't just wrong in this article, he's He's encouraging a kind of ignorance that discourages people from doing personal good. You know, he essentially calls vegetarians self-righteous and portrays us as delusional. The only way he tolerates vegetarianism at all is if we save money from not buying meat, which is obviously not guaranteed, and then donate it to democratic political groups. Obviously, if you want to donate that money that you save, if you do save money, say you're eating like a, a really cheap version of vegetarianism and not buying a bunch of mock meats and, and ice cream like, like some of us do, <laughs> um, then yeah, obviously it would be great to donate that money. Uh, I think you can argue that there are better places to donate to, but regardless, that's, that's a great idea. But to argue that that's essentially the only good thing about it in terms of climate change, at least, again, we can talk about animal welfare and whatnot, and I don't really know his, his stance on that, but to argue that even in terms of climate change, that vegetarianism is bad and the only way to make it good is to donate any money that you save to democratic political campaigns. It's frustrating because, again, as I already said, like he obviously has no problem understanding basic economics when it comes to other progressive issues like housing. I'm guessing because being like pro-development comes at no real cost to him personally, whereas maybe going vegetarian means like personal sacrifice on his part. Like he says in the article, meat is tasty. So, you know, maybe he just doesn't want to give it up or doesn't even want to cut back on meat and he doesn't want to feel bad about not doing that. So yeah, vegetarianism is bad actually. That'll fix the problem. And this isn't unique to Matt. I mean, this is something that a lot of people do, latching onto any argument, no matter how poor, that you know, debunks uh, vegetarianism, recycling, etc. I mean, there are people who have made careers just by denying anthropogenic climate change. And I get it, you know, making a, a personal change like giving up meat is hard and cognitive dissonance sucks unless you're just a bad person and you're just like, yeah, whatever, I'm just gonna be mean to animals and yeah, I don't really care about climate change. It's fine, but most people aren't like that, right? So they have to convince themselves that what they're doing is actually fine. You know, this, this is why I'm so pro like clean meat, 
um, and so pro making plant-based options better and better and better to the point where they are actually really good and actually really affordable. Once giving up meat is no longer a sacrifice, people are not going to feel the need to argue so strongly against the moral imperative of vegetarianism. Cynical, but true. So that's it. I this is, it's one of those things where you, you read something, particularly from someone who you respect and you read a lot from, you know, you kind of have to take a step back and you go, okay, I must be misunderstanding. This is so dumb. <laughs> there's no way that this person, there's, there's no way that this is actually what they're saying, or, you know, there, there's something that I'm not understanding. So I read the article and then I went like, hey, partner, can, you should, you should read this real quick. And he read it and he was like, what? <laughs> This is so dumb. I was like, okay, yeah, <laughs> it's not just me. But again, you know, th this is why we see people seriously, and a lot of times it's not serious, but sometimes it is where people are like, what about plants? Like, don't, don't plants feel pain? I heard about that one study. You know, this is why, this is why people latch onto these things. They want so badly for this not to be a thing, for it not to be important to give up meat. Anyway, I've already said that. I'm gonna stop repeating myself. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Subscribe. That's cool. Uh, support the channel, patreon.com slash unnatural vegan. And I will have a new video very soon. And some farmers are even more motivated to get out of the business. Biz business. 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 <laughs> I'm so tired. Oh my god. <laughs> Whoo. Okay. This is good.